name is Dixie Peters and I'm the technical leader of the Missing Persons Unit at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, Center for Human Identification. The case that I presented today was an identification of a John Wayne Gacy victim. Uh, John Wayne Gacy uh, murdered 33 young men from 1972 to 1978 and only 25 of the victims were ever identified and they were identified through uh, personal artifacts, through dental records, and through Gacy's own admissions, confessions, and his personal relations with some of these uh, young men. So that left eight that were unidentified. In 2011, the Sheriff's County, uh, Cook County Sheriff's Office decided to reopen this as a cold case, and they exhumed those eight sets of mandibles and maxilla and sent those to us to process for DNA. Well, of the eight um, cases that, that we uh, processed, we were able to get full mitochondrial DNA profiles off of all eight of those and then partial SDR profiles off of six of eight of those. Once we had some genetic results, then the Cook County Sheriff's Office made a plea to the public for family members to come forward to give their samples so that they could also be processed and compared to these remains. So. Um, they made that um, press release in October of last year, and November of last year is when we wrote a report on the first association in which we made a mitochondrial association between a sister who was missing her brother. And he was identified as William George Bundy. He was age 19 when he went missing. He went missing in October of 1976, and his sister had always suspected that he was a victim of Gacy, and she and her, uh, her mother had tried to find dental records for him about that time in late 1978 and 79, but his dentist had destroyed those records. So this victim went unidentified for more than 35 years until we were able to use DNA to reunite them. These remains were buried directly into the soil, and the um, the bones themselves were very dark, um, so that some of that the soil particulate had sort of leached into the bones. And also in Chicago, where there's a lot of snowfall and the snow remains on the ground for you know months at a time, um, that kept the ground very moist. And then in addition, when the snow does melt, it continues to keep that soil moist. So that moisture sometimes gives with it you know bacteria and that bacteria will eventually degrade the DNA um, over time so that presented a challenge it's just the age of these bones and the environmental um, insults that they had sustained um, made these challenging we have finished um, our work on the the remains however Cook County does continue to send us family reference samples that we will continue to process and continue to compare to the unidentified remains that we have um, what was interesting, so far we have received 40 family reference samples that represent 24 pedigrees, and we've made that one association that I just mentioned. There was another interesting association that we just made just this past month that it was a mother and father, and we received their samples in uh, the summer of 2012. And it didn't match to any of the Gacy remains. However, it did match to some remains that we had received in 2010. So it was interesting in that we were able to help identify his uh, their son. And what had happened is that their son, during a summer break, had gone to Washington State for a summer job. Then he was traveling back to Chicago, and his choice was to hitchhike. And not really sure exactly what happened. They never heard from him again. And his remains, the remains that were sent to us in 2010, had been found on Mount Olympus in Utah. So not really sure exactly what happened, but oftentimes investigations can't even begin until they know the identity of those remains. But that also highlights the importance of the Missing Persons Program and how um, information, it's so important to try to get that information out to the families and to law enforcement because these families don't know that this services available to them and it's not just in our laboratory but there's other laboratories that perform similar work but if they could come forward and ask for their sample to be taken or if law enforcement would reach out to these families and say hey we can take your sample and submit those to a laboratory and put them into a CODIS database and there's some chance that we would eventually be able to you know help um, bring some sort of closure or some sort of peace to them and figuring out maybe what had happened to their loved ones. But that's just this whole thing is the missing persons just continuing try to do community outreach and to get that information out there and let families know that, you know, it could be 30, 40 years ago or even more that they were missing their loved ones, but it's, it's, it never be too late.